Okay, so uh, moving right along then to the next three chapters. I'm going to cover the next three chapters of René Guénon's uh, Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times in this video. Um, Mircea Eliade apparently said that, of René Guénon that he was a dilettante, and he just sort of dismissed him. Uh, I don't think, reading, this is the first time I've read Guénon, reading these chapters, I don't see any evidence of dilettantism here at all. Syncretism, maybe, yes. Uh, and that's a late thing that comes in at the ends of civilizations when, when they have such a proliferation of cults and religions uh, that it becomes time to start syncretizing them, comparing them, contrasting them, putting them together. And I think that Ganon here can be regarded um, as something similar to the comparative mythologist, uh, like Jung or Joseph Campbell, one who goes back in and looks for the similarities in the traditions and tries to ignore as much as possible the contextual differences in the singularities and pull out the universals so that Campbell pulls out the monomyth, the one myth, the hero's journey as the morphological skeleton, the animal, the ur-animal, as the German biologists uh, of the 18th century would have called it, the ur-animal of mythology of which all the myths are manifestations, uh, analogized to, let's say, Goethe's Urpflanza, where he pulls out the central plant, and it's a numinous idea. It's what Kant would call an idea of the reason. It's a numinous idea, a platonic idea that he extracts by comparing and contrasting all the differences between all the different kinds of plants in the world. And you get the one plant with its various stages and things that happen at each of those stages. Um, so I think what Ganon is doing is something, something similar to that only in the field of esoteric studies, where he's going back through all the traditions and the traditions include both philosophy with uh, Aristotle and Plato and uh, Hindu philosophy and uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, and, uh, as well as the religions themselves with Islam and uh, Greek religiosity and, of course, Hindu, Sanskrit uh, religiosity. And to look for and compare and contrast the philosophical differences to pull out the basic architecture that they all agree on. That's what he's after here. He wants to pull out the basic architecture the ur-animal that animates the essentialist tradition. That's his opbau, that's his Heideggerian act of recovery or destruction that he's performing here. Now, in order to perform this, he has to oversimplify a bit, uh, but I think he does it in a way where he's very aware. He, he keeps uh, the fact that the context change and the meanings change. So what he's doing is setting up a difference engine, uh, what Derrida would call a metaphysical bivalent ontology, uh, with quality and quantity. And quality is analogized to form, quantity is analogized to matter, if we want to bring in the Aristotelian distinction, but it's also the distinction, uh, more properly I think, he likes better. He doesn't want to use the form and matter terminology too much. Uh, he likes essence versus substance better. Um, quality corresponds to uh, essence, quantity corresponds to substance. Um, and he also says that these two terms then correspond to, in the Sanskrit tradition, with the philosophical development there known as Sankhya, uh, to Purusha and Prakriti. And uh, the Sanskrit, as a footnote here, the, the, um, the system of Sankhya was the first sort of godless philosophy that was created by the Hindus to explain creation in a purely philosophical theogony, um, not exactly materialist because it's, it's full of spiritual entities, but not gods. This isn't made by gods, it's made by matter, which destabilizes itself and creates itself through the three gunas, or the three qualities that characterize Prakriti. Prakriti has these three qualities, the three gunas, Rajas guna, which is fiery activity, and its opposite, Tamas guna, which is inertia, torpor, that resists the fiery activity of Rajas guna, and then Safa guna, which is pure, luminous, limpid clarity, which is what the yogi strives to do in his mind, when he uh, detaches himself from the world and settles the waters of the mind to increase the luminosity of the guna known as sattva. So matter prakriti is characterized by that, but of course the yoga process is, a, is about a quest through all that down into the self to find, to fish up the pearl of the purusha. The purusha is simply the monad, the soul as a monad that transmigrates and reincarnates and is a pure element unit of spiritual transmigration. It's the sort of Hindu idea of the self. So Purusha then corresponds to quality, 
uh, and prakriti with all its various designations corresponds basically to quantity, roughly in a loose sense. But also he says to uh, corresponds also to uh, the Aristotelian act and potency. Um, and then he gets into this idea. It also corresponds, he says, to invoking Ananda K. Kumar, Kumar Swami, who was one of the great esotericists of this tradition, uh, that everything in the physical world is known in Sanskrit as nama, rupa, names and forms. But the names nama have to do with capturing the intelligible essences of things, intelligible in the sense that it doesn't have to do with the senses. The mind has to capture it, the name, and in capturing the correct name of something, you capture its essence. And it's the qualitative side of this, whereas rupa has to do with forms. Forms are the sensible, what is visible to us in the senses. In the Upanishads, this would simply be equivalent to maya, the realm of space-time and causality and so forth. So we have all of these uh, consistencies. So he's drawing the, uh, this quantity-quality difference engine and showing its relationship to all of these past similar dichotomies which structure the physical world. But he does get into this interesting discussion here where he's aware that the duality is a relative one. It can apply at a relative level to the world itself or it can apply to an individual entity in that world or it can apply even to individual states of that entity. So it's a relative dichotomy. And he says there that the Aristotelian in the second chapter uh, on uh, materia signata quantitate, he says that uh, highly, the Aristotelian conception of matter as highly is essential, would essentially correspond to the old idea of matter as substance. Uh, and substance is simply the substratum underneath all things. It's not visible. You can't see it. Um, it's already qualified. By the time you see it, the mind has to extract it. By the time you see it, it's already, you're already dealing with Nama Rupa, names and forms. Everything is already qualified in form and shape, number, quantity, and so forth. Uh, the mind has to extract this idea that there is a mysterious substance underneath all of this, supporting all of it, that is pure potentiality, pure passive potentiality for the receptivity of form. And so in the form and matter dichotomy, form is always masculine and paternal. Quality is masculine and paternal and substance matter quantity, that realm is always feminine and passive and has to do with pure receptivity for the imprinting of form. Uh, matter in this tradition uh, is something kind of mysterious, uh, Ganon says in these chapters, as it is still mysterious to this day. And this, by the way, uh, he's digging all this up to show that the modern physicist's conception of matter is degenerate. It has nothing to do with any of this. It's lost all these qualitative distinctions and it represents matter simply as pure quantity pure number. But he's trying to get at the root of how and why this happened here. So he's got this idea of highly, and he says that um, it's equivalent also to the scholastics discussion in their distinction of matter now. They came up with another dichotomy. So we're within the quantitative side now. Uh, within that, we find the same or similar structural dichotomy between two types of matter, uh, materia prima and materia secunda. Prima materia is matter as highly, which is pure receptivity for form. It's in essence unintelligible because there's nothing intelligible in it. It has no qualities, it's just pure matter. So that's prima materia. It is the absolute universal substance out of which all things are made, pure potency. Materia secunda, Ganon says, is never uh, pure potency. Materia secunda has to do with what Aquinas called materia signata quantitate, which is pure quantity. So materia secunda is closer to number and measure than uh, the prima materia, which is a more, I think, more metaphysical idea, pure receptivity for form, whereas quantity is the thing that imprints that pure receptivity, stamps it with the, the discrete quantitative aspect. Although he gets into an issue here, and I think this gets to the root of the ontological shift that he's sensing here that happened in the 17th century, where uh, with materia secunda as pure quantity, um, with materia secunda as pure quantity, we've got this idea that quantity has three modes. It has uh, the mode of measure, there's, so there's quantity as measure, there's quantity as number, and weight. He, weight isn't part of this discussion, though. He focuses on this discussion between these two modes of, qu of pure quantity in materia secunda as uh, number and measure. This is an important distinction because for him, measure has to do with the measuring of what he calls continuous quantity, 
that's essentially the lead to geometry and the measurement of things extended in space and time. That's what measure does as pure quantity. But the other form of pure quantity as number has to do with uh, discontinuous quantity. So that leads into atomistic theories. And he says this is the problem. What happened here in the 17th century is that matter began to be perceived under the uh, mode of pure quantity as number rather than measure, as it has always been for forever, as uh, number as measure, which is discontinuous quantity, and you get atomistic theories, which imagine matter as discrete, made up of packets, of units. That's number. Dis that's the application of number uh, to something that is essentially ineffable and in unmeasurable. Matter is, it is continuous. And he says, that, yes, of course, numbers are used for measure, but they're applied as a tool in the use of measuring uh, continuous quantities in the realm that leads to geometry. And I think what he's getting at here is this idea that the ontological shift that happened in the 17th century uh, was the rediscovery of the atomists hypothesis uh, by people like Descartes and Robert Boyle, uh, later Pierre Gassendi, Leibniz, although Leibniz will try to liven things up with his monads, but uh, they rediscovered this, the Greeks' old atomistic ontology because the texts are starting to come in, they're being translated, and now they're fascinated with this idea. Uh, Descartes says that matter is pure extension, and Ganon says that's the beginnings of the decline of the tradition in which modernity begins to come in with the first idea of matter as pure extension. But he says it's not, there are still other elements in Descartes uh, which aren't yet fully mappable on to the modern conception of matter. But he has this res extension matter as pure extension, as things extended in space. Um, <clears throat> but what we want to do is capture this idea of the ontological shift now that happens when you shift from pure quantity as number away from pure quantity as measure, which has more to do with geometry and of course, what Ganon is going to talk about here is sacred geometry, the sacred geometry from out of which that was for the ancients synonymous with architecture and from out of which all the great sacred buildings were built, the pyramids and all of that stuff in which quantity and quality weren't separate. Quantity was together with quality and things had spiritual resonances as Pythagorean numbers do. Pythagorean numbers aren't pure quantities. They're qualitative quantities filled with all kinds of numinous uh, mystical ideas for each one of those numbers. It's a totally different uh, approach to number and mathematics and measure than the atomistic theory. Now keep in mind here that the atomistic theory came in for the Greeks too and destroyed their tradition, their great metaphysical esoteric spiritual traditions also with Leuchipus and Democritus and Lucretius, all were atomists and they came in and brought materialism into the late Hellenistic dying ecumeny of the world horizon of the classical world. So atomism, uh, I think Ganon is wanting to associate in your mind, is associated with materialism and with decadent end phases of civilizations where the scientists feed the materialism of the masses by giving them an ontology of materialism uh, that sort of gives them the basis for their hedonism and, and uh, decadent activities. So with that shift in the 17th century, here's the point I want to get to. And this is the point I think Ganon is getting to uh, and is implying here is that with that shift, the sciences of alchemy and astrology went out because they were not based on atomism. They were not based on this idea of the world as uh, composed of uh, quantity as number, pure units. But it was this idea of matter was a continuum made out of properties, made out of properties such as the hot and the cold, the wet and the dry. And when you combine those four principles, you get earth, air, fire, and water. Everything was made up out of elements. Earth is ultimately that which goes down. Water goes down, but it spreads. Uh, air goes up and spreads, and fire goes straight up. So fire uh, is the opposite of earth, and air. fire and air then become associated with spiritual elements, Water and earth then become associated with heavy, weighty, dense material elements. But nonetheless, the world is thought to be made up out of these qu these qualities, these four qualities. There's a fifth essence, the quintessence, uh, that the spheres are made up out of. That gives them uh, not up and down directionality, but perfect circular turning. That's what makes the spheres, the planets turn in these perfect geometrical circles. 
And what gives the basis for an ontology of correspondence is as above, so below. Uh, so you have astrology uh, where as a cosmic mirror that mirrors the events that are going on down below. You have alchemy as the science for the transformation of matter. It's perfection and sublimatio. You can transform gold. You can transform base metals into gold or into the Philosopher's Stone because you can do this transformational process. It's not based on atoms. It's based on purification of these various properties through very complex processes of negrito, uh, albedo, rubido, the blackening of matter, the melting of it down, the rub the uh, uh, the rubido, the, the whitening and purifying of it, and finally the rubido, the production of the redness uh, that leads to the production of the gold and the philosopher's stone. All these qualities are going on that went on in, in sacred science forever um, until the, the, the resurrection of the atomist hypothesis in the 17th century pulled the ontological rug out from under these sciences. They went down the drain with this idea of matter as measure, as something continuous, measure, as pure quantity as measure. It leads to extension and geometry, the measurement of things in space and time. All that goes out and you get the atomization of matter as a new ontology that is quantity in its mode as pure number, which is different from measure because it sees matter as con uh, discontinuous, really a discontinuous quantity. So you get a paradigm shift, a total ontological paradigm shift, and Ganon is going to identify this as the threshold of modernity where we lost contact with the traditions of esoteric geometry, sacred geometry, uh, the geometry that takes into account the building of a building in accordance with astral and etheric energies that align places that put you, uh, when you go to these places, in accordance with their etheric energies. And you, you feel that there are indeed such energies. They exist. They're real. And uh, But that all of that kind of sacred science that Ganon is trying to bring back in here went out. And then in this third chapter, he goes into this discussion of measure, where he says matter, uh, it's difficult to trace the etymology of matter. Uh, on the one hand, it seems to be related to mater, mother, and therefore to give matter its idea of passive receptivity, its feminine passive receptivity for the imprinting of form, form coming being the spiritual paternal uh, principle there. But he says it's more likely related to measure. Matter is more likely related to words like the, uh, the Latin word materi, which means to measure. And then you get measure then leading into the idea of order. Measure um, sort of brings back the ancient cosmogonies, the, the great spiritual ordering principles of measure that order the principle by extracting from chaos, which is the material element of chaos that precedes creation, illuminating with spiritual intelligence and pulling a cosmos out of it. The Greek word cosmos with a K is the order that is produced from that process of the spirit shining the light down into the darkness of matter, impregnating it with form and producing an ordered cosmos out of all of that so that everything is spiritually oriented. In the Sanskrit tradition, this is called rita. Rita is the cosmic ordering principle. And all of these traditions have this idea. In Chinese, in, in Chinese uh, tradition, it's the Tao. Uh, in India, uh, Rita, but also there are other principles later, like Dharma and Karma and so forth. But uh, in the old Mesopotamian tradition, it's Me, M-E, the ordering principle there. And in Egypt, it's Mat, the goddess of truth, whose principle is the basis for the order of all things. And so he goes in and retrieves a bit of this, uh, these cosmological ideas by saying that measure is this old idea of organizing the cosmos into spiritually coherent manifestations and planes in which form and matter are wed together, quality and quantity are wed together, they're not separated out into a degeneration of matter as pure quantitative units without qualitative resonances, they're married together and you get a properly spiritual worldview that he's trying to resurrect here and bring back into modernity. Um, so we'll leave it there with this video uh, for those three chapters.